Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Michael Hollish. He has his own podcast called The Reform Report. He covers a lot of the Cosa Nostra history, which is the American Mafia. He's done a lot of Mafia interviews. He was definitely one of the guys that really first started off this whole Mafia genre, you know, and interviewing guys that used to be in the life. Today in this interview, me and Michael talk about his interviews and some of the guys he had on and what eventually led him up to, you know, being a podcaster and being a host of his own show. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Michael's story. The first thing that came about, you know, was it the podcasting, the music, because you make music, you know, or, you know, what what, what came first for you, you know, start when you were a kid? Well, I guess, when did you start all this? You said 20 years ago? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um... So like a lot of other musicians, I started in a, you know, playing in high school in a punk band, playing in the Tampa scene. And uh, then, you know, playing across Central Florida. And ultimately, that was like 93. So basically just kind of cut my teeth playing in the Central Florida uh, punk scene for like four years and then we uh I, I joined a band that had a uh a distribution deal and that was like my first kind of foray into taking it just from playing live on the weekends to uh wow this thing's more professional setting up tours uh you know and having some deadlines and and, and somebody to, else to answer to Right. So that's kind of how it all started. Yeah. And, you know, how long were you doing that, you know, that with the distribution deal? You know, like what was it that, you know, about, you know, like what, is, what was the whole thing idea behind, you know, signing with them? Well, the music industry in the mid 90s to the music industry today is totally different. You know, back then, uh, you know, you had to deal with, a distributor, a record label, um, to get your music out, you know, whether, uh, you know, through a management to get, you know, if you put out a single or whatever to get your music marketed to radio or in record shops or uh, licensing and, and everything else. So you had to be good enough to get yeah. a distribution or a record deal, um, you know, because this was you know, uh, five, four or five years before the whole Napster MP3 thing, which I think were kind of the first of the, uh, you know, putting, you know, MP3s out. Mm -hmm. um, so today it's, you know, I had this conversation with somebody the other day. It's like, it's easier today to get your music out you know, you can do basically everything yourself without really having to deal with a record label at all. Mm -hmm. um, however, that means everybody can get their music out, you know, and it's so simple. So it's almost like an over flooded market. And, uh, you know, and it's just like it was back then. It's like the people that have a good product are always going to rise up to the top. But unfortunately, you still have to have a niche. You still have to have some way of marketing yourself to kind of work through the muck to yeah. get your product out in front. Um, you know, and like I was talking to a friend who just uh, finalized, uh, got off of his record label. Um, and he was like, well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to go and shop our material to a new label. And I was telling him that, you know, really, instead of trying to get onto another label that, you know, the issue he had with this previous label where they were just like pushing their top two or three bands and the other rest of the, uh, you know, band signed to the label were basically just getting the record put out. The records weren't getting pushed. Oh. So I told him, I said, you know, really what you should do is go out and hire an agent, uh, you know, like a publicist. You're recording your stuff on your own anyway. Just put yourself, you know, put your material out on your own and then, you know, work with a publicist and an agent to work out a marketing plan. 
for, you know, for your new material and just bypass the label concept altogether. But the problem is the people, you know, from our generation and before it's instilled in us that, you know, you have to deal with the record label, you know, because it's always, it was always that way, you know, until about probably 2000, you know? Yeah. So now people can just, they're, I mean, you know, like people in his situation, you know, they're better off, you know, just, you know, go, like you said, going and get an agent and, you know, just pushing yourself, you probably get more results than, you know, just kind of sitting on the shelf there, you know what I mean? Right. Well, you know, and unfortunately it takes money to make money. So then the problem lies that you have to go and retain an agent, you got to pay a publicist, but the problem with a record label, they have all of those resources, but you know, it's like, it's almost like you're good enough to get on the label, but your if your product isn't selling, you know, they're always going to push the, the, the top percentile of their, you know, their catalog because it's a business and they're in it to make money. You know, they're not so really into it to push art as much as they are to profit off of art. So they're going to, you know, get behind the most profitable art, you yeah. know, that's, I mean, that's, it's business, you know. So what opportunities did that, you know, kind of lead up for you to do after you signed with the, you know, a distribution deal? Well, that was, uh, that was in 97. That was just a really small, a really small distribution yeah. deal. It was like a domestic distribution deal, but it was just an introduction into that mm -hmm. for me uh, and gave me kind of like a foundation and an understanding um, in, uh, uh, after that, I would say around 99, uh, well, in 98, I started this, I got in, started this band Grim Fairies and we were, um, essentially an industrial band and, uh, the, my partner in that he was in, he came from pig face and my life at the thrill kill cult. And these were pretty much like godfathers of that movement. You know, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails was in Big Face at one time. Um, and all of that came out of the Chicago movement, which was, you know, Chicago, the wax track scene was kind of like the Seattle to grunge. It, it was basically what the Chicago wax track scene was to industrial music, like Ministry came out of that scene. Um, Nine Inch Nails were from Ohio, but they started off on Wax Tracks TVT, their label. So um, by getting, you know, starting that project, we kind of had a foot ahead because he was already working in those, you know, legendary industrial acts. So, uh, you know, we basically took a year to write, you know, the write our set, work on our, basically our stage perception, how we were going to market ourselves. And uh, in the meantime, we started putting uh, material out on compilations, you know, where a label would, you know, like a compilation record, you know, that, that maybe not necessarily all bands. Sometimes a, a label will put out a compilation of just bands on their label to kind of promote themselves and saying, hey, this is our catalog. These artists are on our label. Uh, other labels will may put out a specialized compilation that you know, maybe a tribute album or whatever. And they'll just take artists from, you know, unsigned artists or artists from other labels because they're basically just licensing for this one product. Um, so we were doing like a lot of compilation records. And, um, you know, so at, with that, we were dealing with, you know, labels like Cleopatra Records, uh, Invisible up in Chicago, which was, uh, you know, a pretty you know, I don't want to say groundbreaking because they kind of took where Wax Tracks left off, but they were a very uh, respectable um, in industrial label. So we were doing a lot of stuff with them. Um, and that label was ran by Martin Atkins, who was the drummer of Killing Joke. He worked with Ministry, Nine Inch Nails. Um, he was in the head like a whole video, actually, that was on MTV uh, for Nine Inch Nails. And uh, so we were working through his label a lot. And uh, doing a lot of tours with a lot of those artists because that's kind of like the scene that we, you know, the how we marketed ourselves and the people that we knew. So we were taking advantage of that 
you know, that and, and those opportunities and do it, you know, networking that way. Yeah. And, uh, and that project actually, uh, we had an opportunity because we did a couple soundtracks as well. And uh, we did a, um, I, I don't know if you're familiar, Electronic Arts, the video game company. Well, they, uh, they, there was a video game company called Origins, and they were like a big PC, like a, a computer game, video games. And I'm not a gamer, so, uh, but they, uh, they contacted us to do uh, some soundtrack work for this Ultima video game. And, uh, and that game was like the, it, I, I don't know what they call it, but it, it was like the first game that uh came out where every character is you know people subscribe to the game and every character is played by somebody somewhere in the world you know the different subscribers have their little characters and it's almost like a precursor to the world of warcraft if you remember that game yeah, yeah. so we uh we got contacted by origins uh and we did uh some songs for the ultima online 2 video game and uh, or Origins ended up getting bought out by Electronic Arts. Um, so that was a short-lived uh, uh, collaboration, but we did do that game project. And that, for me, ultimately led me to where I am today, you know, where I segued into doing film and television scoring and soundtrack work and Foley recording and stuff, so. Yeah, so. You know, when, what was it that led you into that? You know, like, did someone reach out to you or did you just really have a niche for it? Mm, no, no. Well, um, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think early on. Um, I think actually on a couple of the earlier things I did, which were, you know, like, B movies basically uh I was contacted to do those you know and it really at that time there wasn't much pay because they were low budget films right. but it was an opportunity for me to kind of work that process and 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 understand it and I did uh I did a few of those films uh you know and I'm not if the filmmakers end up watching this I'm not knocking what they did I mean they, they did what they could with the budget they had, you know, right. they, and, uh, they were very, uh, they did it, you know, I mean, you can't yeah. knock anybody that has a passion for something and gets out there and does it. You know, a lot of people that will sit back and criticize are people that have never done anything, you know, so it's, uh, you know, so, uh, they, they follow their passion. They did that. But a lot of the stuff that I do with film, uh, is more in the more horror genre. I mean, a lot of the music that I, my musical background and a lot of music I do, it was more dark, you know, dark music, you know, uh, the industrial dark wave sound. And that has, uh, that has never left me. I've kind of carried that into my composition work, um, you know, and, uh, and I've been able to utilize some of the old tracks from the bands to be able to get placed on various soundtracks. But a lot of the stuff I do with the underscoring, it's orchestral stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, composition work, you know. So then what was your, uh, you know, when you got into film, because you mm -hmm. know, you've been doing it for 20 years, right? Um, well, no, uh, the film work I've been doing now for about 10 years. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I was do I was working, you know, basically doing the music industry thing, which is, you know, writing, recording, you know, putting out albums, touring, uh, you know, I did that for 20, 19 years, actually, um, to be exact. And then uh, around 2012 is when I first started working, uh, recording for visual media for film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I mean, we did that game in 2012 one but you know and I, I continued doing the music uh avenue for like another whatever that is 11 years you know but uh but that planted a seed in me saying wow you know 
that was a really cool thing. It was a really cool opportunity. And now, mind you, that was a game that had a, a huge, uh, you know, marketability, a huge base because it, you know, it was a popular game at the time. And, uh, you know, back then, computer games were real, like, kind of like all the rage. You know, this was before the, you know, all these big gaming consoles came out, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, from my understanding, a lot of people back then at least played computer games. Yeah. Um, but, um, but anyway, yeah, 2012 is when I kind of segued into film. And uh, that's pretty much all I've done now for the past 10 years. It's just uh, score doing Foley, uh, scoring underscore for film, uh, a little bit of TV, internet. Uh, I did another gaming project um, about, mm, I don't know when that was. It's, it's been about six years. I did another PC game project that was from the same producer that worked on the Ultima game. Uh, contacted me. So I did a song for that. And it was another PC game, but it was with a different company. Uh, like I said, Origin was bought out by Electronic Arts. So I think a lot of those guys lost their job and, you know, EA brought in their own, you know, yeah. uh, designers and whatnot. So what is so, a few of your, uh, you know, few big projects that you've done for producing that are your favorite? Um, well, on the film stuff, there is a, uh, a film co company that I do a lot of work with is called Maz Appeal. They um, a really cutting edge uh, company. Um, it's a very close knit company, and uh, the uh, creative mind of that Joseph Mazzaferro, he is a super uh, talented filmmaker. And uh, we did a film about three years ago called Halloween at Ann Ethel's. It, it was a feature film and uh, it screened at the Cannes Film Festival in France. You know, people say the Cannes Film Festival, it's the Cannes Film Festival. Um, so that was a big deal. And uh, through that, it picked up theatrical distribution in, in a few countries. And then uh, it uh, got picked up for streaming by Amazon Prime. That's still on Amazon Prime, so people can stream mm -hmm. that there. It's a, uh, it's become like a, a cult Halloween film, you know. So like around Halloween time, it's always placed on like a top ten list of Halloween movies to watch, you know. So that that to me is very cool, and and I thought it was a very camp, like a campy done film, but in a in a good way, you know. You know how like Evil Dead is like really campy, but in a good way, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a little over the top, but it's meant to be, you know, almost like Tim Burton films are the same way. And it kind of has that Burton-esque kind of vibe to it. Not the budget of a Burton film, but <laughs> that kind of vibe. And, um, and it, it's a, that was, that was one I was really proud of. And the guy, um, one of the uh, main actors in that, uh, actually is, uh, was cast in this, um, 50 Cent series, the uh, Black Family Mafia series, the BMF, uh, is it? Yeah, Black it? Family, BFM, oh, BFM, okay. is that oh, what yeah. it would be? Black Family Mafia, yeah. Damn, he played cool. a detective, detective in that, so he had like a, you know, a co-starring, reoccurring role in that series, and uh, I thought that was really cool, you know? Yeah, because he got an opportunity from that too, from what you helped build. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's always well, good. I mean, it was Joseph's film, but yeah, that I scored and uh, you know did you know did some music on that, and uh, which is all part of the process. You know, yeah. it's like you take a score out of a film, the vibe totally changes. You know, and but uh, yeah, I mean the all aspects of that was uh, you know with any film is you know I'm only a, a portion. You know, obviously, you know, the way it's shot, the lighting, the feel, the textures, camera angles, obviously the acting is important. The yeah. story is important. The script is important. So you take all these elements and, then, you know, everybody doing their part and putting it all together and just making something, you know, magical at the yeah. end, you know, and that to me is just a super cool process. You know, you're working with all these different creative minds who are talented at doing their own 
thing, you know, uh, I, I'm not a, you know, good at shooting through a camera. I don't understand filters and everything, you know, I wouldn't even know where to start with that uh, to get things right. And, and, you know, the light grade and all that, just yeah, like yeah. Uh, the, the camera guy wouldn't know where to start, you know, with uh, doing composition work or yeah. fully tracking. You, know. you got to know your strengths and your weaknesses. That's for sure. <laughs> that's why yeah. it's good to have a group group like yeah. that. You know what I mean? And all kinds of different people from creative backgrounds and stuff, you know, so it right. helps. So you right. were able to, you know, kind of put that into your own podcast, right? Were you with these skills that you've learned through the music, you know, producing, you know, doing the film, you know? Yeah. The, well, you know, the, I would say, oh, and by the way, that actor's name is Sean Michael Gloria. That's, that's oh, the nice. name. Okay. <laughs> series so yeah um um i would say the one thing that i've applied <laughs> to my podcast which is nothing to do with the production end of it but is the network because with music it's just non-stop networking you know i mean you're you're constantly you're you're uh i use, i heard al jurgensen in an interview the other day uh you know using the word promo sexual you know, you're a promo sexual because you're nonstop promoing your your shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, you know, you're like a you know uh, like a media whore. Basically, <laughs> basically. you yeah. almost have to be. You know, because again, you know, it's a cutthroat business. You're 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 pushing your art. You know, it's not like you're being vain. You're just pushing what you accomplished. You're trying to get the most out of it that you can. Well, through that, I mean, you're constantly networking. You know, you're you're handling. You know, maybe if you're, you know, trying to cut some corners and you're handling some bookings on your own, you're dealing with clubs, you're dealing with booking agents, you know, you're you're dealing with sending out press kits to radio stations or, or you, you know, to newspapers to get record reviews or magazines, whatever. So you're nonstop making contacts, you're nonstop making phone calls. And I've kind of been able to, since I've hone that skill um and uh you know i've applied that obviously to my uh podcast because that's what i do you know it's like i non-stop research people that i want to try to have on uh maybe they have a compelling story obviously their background falls within the parameters of what i'm doing with my voices from cosa nostra segment on the reform report and so you know i'm making those contacts some of these guys don't want to talk publicly, you know, and, I, and I've had a few guys that have turned me down and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to talk, you know, about that. They kind of see how some of these guys are, uh, how do I, you know, I don't know how I want to say this the right way, but how some of these guys are making themselves look and not in a good way. Um, you know, maybe it's that, or maybe it's just that, they still have instilled in them, even though maybe perhaps they cooperated or whatever they may have done in their past, but they still have instilled in them that it's just something they don't want to talk about or, you know, for whatever reason, you know, um, but I've had a few of those guys that I've contacted that weren't interested and that's fine. You know, I, I respect everybody, um, you know, and uh, that's just, you know, and I understand that too, you know, because uh, for a long time, it's like, I, I didn't want to talk about music. You know, people would ask uh, me to tell stuff. It's like, you just, you know, you kind of live something and you don't really want to talk about it all the time. You know, yeah. I don't know. You yeah, know, that's probably how I mean, have, have you run into that issue where you've tried to contact somebody and they're like, yeah, I don't Oh want yeah, to. of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. that just, that's just how it is, you know, but right. some of them don't, you know, and I understand that, you know, and you like, or they've told their story so many times, they just don't want it to tell it no more. Right. You know, so it's I like, why do I need to water it down? Yeah, go yeah, exactly. Right. And it's like, who's going to watch it too at the same time? You know, if it's already been out there and they've already watched it a bunch of times. So that's why with yours, I like watching yours, you know, because you've been doing it for like six years, I think, your podcast. Yeah, yeah so, seven, seven now. Seven, right. damn. Yeah. So I just ran into it this year and, you know, I was going back on, you know, stuff that you had from six years ago with like John A. Light and uh, what was his name? The, FBI agent. Uh, Jack Garcia, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, him. Jack, and... Jack was actually one of my first interviews. Actually, my very, very first interview 
was with a gentleman named Eddie Gonzalez. He was a trafficker, a cocaine trafficker for the Medellin cartel. But he wasn't a Colombian. He was a Cuban. Oh. And um, it, it was a very tough interview. I did it as an audio interview. But because he had such hard, broken English, I ended up <laughs> doing it as a print interview because oh. it's, uh, it, it wouldn't have been enjoyable for anyone to listen to. You know, oh, so um, it was really hard. Yeah, it was very difficult to decipher. And uh, some of his stuff, I just had to really kind of keep going back and going over it. Super nice guy. Very crazy story. And, uh, you know, and he was, uh, you know, he came from, Castro's Cuba and was sent over on the Muriel boat lift, which is portrayed at the beginning of Scarface when they were all coming over on the boat during the like late seventies, the Carter administration. And uh, so he was part of that whole thing. The Muriel boat lift came to America, kind of was forced to come here and didn't know anybody. You know, the only people that he could communicate with were the other Hispanics in Miami Mm -hmm. He ended up going to the Keys, working in a boat marina, scraping barnacles off the bottom of boats, and mm -hmm. found out that they it was a marine, like a front, basically, to launder money for the cartel, and they were trafficking cocaine out of there. So, you know, they're like, hey, do you want to make real money, you know, instead of doing this slave crap, you know, so he started uh, pushing, you know, kilos of cocaine up the East coast of the United States, you know, for the cartel, you know. Sure. So, Damn. So, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, when you go about these, like you said, it's just networking, you know, trying to, oh, this guy knows this guy, this guy knows this, because your podcast, you know, it's all about, um, you know, the mafia, the mob, the mafia, you right. know. Oh, yeah. Yes, for sure. You know, so, you know, how do you continue to pursue it? You know, like, do you continue to find different people to interview that were involved in that, or are you going to start like making up? you know, different stories that you've done research on or how do you go about uh, with yours? So I have done a few commentaries. I mean, my, my specialty actually, when it comes to the mafia of where, what I've researched in depthly is the, is the history of Tampa. Mm -hmm. I'm from Tampa and it's tangible to me. I've known, I know individuals who were in the Traficante family. They're no, obviously no longer connected. There really isn't a Traficante family anymore. It's pretty much gone. Uh, there's still people from the Traficante family in Tampa, but it's a non-operational family, uh, Cosa Nostra family. Um, so that, you know, is probably uh, maybe an area that I may segue into to do some commentary stories. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I could cover here. Uh, stories that pertain to New Yorkers that came down. I mean, John A. Light operated in Tampa, and that's how he got on my radar initially. Because back when I interviewed him, you know, he didn't do there. Uh, well, nobody was really doing mafia interviews. I mean, Vlad did a couple here and there, but he mainly was focused on like, you know, black gangs like the Bloods and the Crips and the rappers. So he do a mob interview here and there, but really, there was nobody else on YouTube that were just doing mafia interviews. They were doing commentary shows and crime shows, but not That's specified nice. on bringing guests, you know, mob guests on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like you said, you know, early on, it was a very fresh thing because a lot of these guys hadn't uh, been, I mean, they've told their story and you know, A-Light already had the Gotti's Rules book was already out and he had done media and stuff like that. But uh, he hadn't been, you know, uh, maybe aside from Vlad and, and a couple other random podcasts, he hadn't done too many YouTube interviews. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I really was interested in him because he came down uh, when the Gambino family were planting their flag in Tampa. And he, uh, you know, operated in Tampa on the tail end of his, uh, you know, criminal life. You know, and then there's an argument with that because obviously the Gotti side said at that point, A-Light wasn't associated with the Gambino family, but, uh, it, but he was in fact, you know, whether him and John Jr. may have had a fallen out at that point and, and maybe that partially played into him leaving New York and coming to Tampa, 
but he was still affiliated with uh, Ronnie one arm Truccio, who was a Gambino captain, who was also down coming back and forth between New York and Tampa. So uh, I, t- I definitely tend to believe a light on that. He definitely was still affiliated with the Gambino family when he was uh, down here, you know? Yeah. I just did an interview with him too recently, you know, and it was, it was pretty good. you know, we kind of talked about all that too. You know, we did, probably 45 minutes, you know, it was good. You know, I mean, he's a lot, like you said, I mean, you did yours six years ago. I did mine, you know, just recently. So, I mean, you know, the stories, you know, he says from then and back then, you know, they, they're still the same. It's not like, like you said, it's kind of hard. Some of the guys, you know, are, you know, I don't know why, but you know, like they get mad at each other and they're like, Oh, you said this, you know, like the, the mob guys and stuff, you know, they don't get along sometimes. So it's hard to get well, them on a platform at the same time. You know, the thing is with all those guys, I mean, obviously they all have alpha personalities, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and they're all, I don't understand. Uh, I mean, you kind of see this in every genre. I mean, it's even like this with bands. So, you, you know, like, like going back to the music thing, you know, in your genre of music, you know, you're, com- you're, it's almost like a competition in a way. You know, and who, you know, who the, someone may put out some stuff. You're putting out an album at the same time, y'all, are whatever. I mean, it's not the same, but there's similarities to it. There's always competition in everything. With them, I don't see really why the, uh, I don't understand them having to feel a need to feel, you know, and I don't want to say it, but to feel threatened that, you know, this guy's getting attention, you know, part of it's envy and jealousy, you know, I mean, obviously Mike Franzese and Sammy Gravano are making a ton of money right now, you know, and, and, you know, when you get other guys who are trying to, you know, maybe make a career out of social media and then maybe they're not quite doing as good as what those two guys are, that could play into it a little bit. Maybe, uh, you know, some feelings from the street. You know, these a lot of these guys dealt with each other on the street. They knew each other. They knew of each other. Whatever the case may be, maybe, you know, some of that plays into it, too. So, you know, these guys definitely are the type that oh, definitely hold grudges. And that just doesn't go away. You know, and that might be in a, not so much speaking for a like he's an Albanian. But with the rest of them, you know, it might be an Italian thing. I mean, my wife's an Italian, so I know how that is. But, uh, um, well, either way, we don't, you know, as us, me and you, we're just reporters. We don't have to take a side. You know what I mean? Right. So, I mean, my, I'm, I'm not bashing anybody or nothing like that. You know, I'm just 100%. saying that it's just hard to get a mo- multiple of them on a platform at once, you know, because uh, yeah, there, there's gonna... tension. <laughs> right. Well, and everybody wants, you know, they, the, the, yeah, they want it to be about them. It's their interview. It's like, why? You know what I mean? It, I can, yeah, I, I, I can see that. I've never tried to get two, two on at one time. I, um, but it, it's interesting. Yeah, I. Um, I think the most I've done was like four. I had Bobby Luisi, Paul Tanso, uh, Larry Mazza. No, it was three. Yeah, it was them three. And they're all, but see, that's different because all three of those guys are close friends. Right. Tanzo was in Luisi's crew on the streets, yeah. so they go back decades. Yeah. Uh, and Mazza is very close with both of them now. Yeah. And uh, and and two, um, at least speaking for Bobby and Paul, they, they're they're pretty passive guys. They're not real aggressive. Uh, they're very pleasant to talk to, and Larry is too. Um, so I, you know, they're they're a little bit different. You know, uh, that that's if I were to pick three to do something like that, you you picked it perfect. <laughs> you know, good good personalities there to right. make it work. You know, yeah, that's what it takes. You know, and they went good. They went great. You know, but yeah, you know, but yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to? to say before we wrap up or have anything else you want to talk about well first of all you know what i you know when we did the lot the podcast the other week you know and you were saying that you know you wanted to kind of broaden your horizons i thought that was freaking awesome 
because you know the thing is it's like this is a the crime market pertaining to the mafia is a pretty saturated market and everybody kind of does their own thing some guys you know like jeff nadu you know does uh commentary history which he does a, a great job at um you know oc shorts does that uh, my platform is predominantly interviews I've done a couple commentaries and I, I'll probably segue into that a little bit around the interviews. And then you got the whole other group of guys who are call themselves mob channels, but they more or less just bicker back and forth with each other. Um, I, you know, I, I tried to kind of stay away from that whole scene. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, I'm not emotionally invested in any of it because it's like, I don't know anybody in post. Uh, aside from a few of my sources I've interviewed. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think how you said you were going to be doing your channel, I think that's freaking awesome, man. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in military history, so I kind of delve into that a little bit as well. Um, so that's something I'd like to kind of continue to do here and there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, otherwise, you know, just kind of keep on keeping on, you know. Uh, the one thing I will plug is, again, Narco Wars will be coming out in uh, probably in the next uh, six to eight weeks. It should start airing on uh, Nat Geo. And, and from what I know right now, it'll be the same type scheduling that season two was. So there'll be a show every week over a span of six weeks with them continuously running the reruns around that. And then as the shows screen... They'll, you know, you can, people can stream them on Hulu, you know, Hulu and uh, Nat Geo, ABC, and uh, some of the other streaming platforms, but Hulu is the big one, you know. Yeah. Well, you know what, man? Thank, Thank you. you. I really do appreciate you coming on and yeah, taking out time. Absolutely, dude. You rock. I want to see you doing good things. So, um, you know what? Just let me know anything and everything you got going on so I can promote it on my channel for you. Well, what'd you think? I mean, this was a really good interview. I'm glad me and Michael got to chop it up because he's definitely someone, you know, that I looked up to when I first started getting into this whole genre, you know, the mafia's content and everything like that. I mean, I did a lot of research from his channel. You know, I mean, I found a lot of mafia guys, did a lot of interviews with a lot of different guys that he had in, in common. So please comment a key takeaway that you got from this video and subscribe to his channel. I'll put a link in the video description. It's really good. I think you'll enjoy it if you enjoyed this interview review also please don't forget to hit subscribe to my channel if you want to support me and my brand i got t-shirts hoodies beanies sweats all on my website i'll put a link in the video description also be on the lookout for the documentary series that i've been putting together michael's not on it but a lot of other guys that he's familiar with and a lot of guys that he interviewed are going to be on it my documentary that i'm working on is about the american mafia and there's 11 episodes and each episode is about a different crime family and at the end of this video there'll be a playlist button that you can hit so you can watch all my other mafia interviews thank you so much again for watching